Hello, uh, my name is Cedar Saigo, and I'm a member of the Squamish tribe. Uh, my tribe runs to about a thousand enrolled members, and we're located uh, across the water uh, from Seattle. Um, and I have, I'm also a poet, and I've never been asked to do a land acknowledgement before. And so in thinking about it, um, I was kind of starting to think about my experience of the land acknowledgement and how so often it can just end up seeming like this empty set of obligatory words, somewhat like saying the Pledge of Allegiance when one is in elementary school, thinking later on, what do these words actually mean? And can these words actually um, do anything? Um, does the acknowledgement eventually move toward justice in some way? Um, and it makes me think a lot of our current poet laureate, jo Joy Harjo, who's a Muscogee Creek uh, native. And in an interview, she was asked, what did she think was possible in terms of reclamation through native poetry at this point in history? And she said that she did not, it wasn't her intention to reverse history, but rather to draw out the strength. And I think that's sort of the best possibility for the land acknowledgement to draw out the strength of the communities that remain. And in that spirit, I wanted to read a short paragraph from Joy Harjo's introduction to this new book of poetry published by Norton. It's this huge anthology uh, titled, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through. And this is from Joy's introduction. Our existence as sentient human beings in the establishment of this country was denied. Our presence is still an afterthought and fraught with tension because our continued presence means that the mythic storyline of the founding of this country is inaccurate. The United States is a very young country and has been in existence for only a few hundred years. Indigenous peoples have been here for thousands upon thousands of years and we are still here. And I wanted to close uh, with a poem um, that deals with Old Man House, which was the winter longhouse for the Suquamish people. And we used it for forever, and it was eventually uh, burned in 1890 by Catholic missionaries around the same time that our religious practices uh, were outlawed. And uh, I wanted to do kind of a site-specific poem that is to visit uh, the site of Old Man House and then ask myself, what did you learn here? So that's the title of this. What did you learn here? Starting from Old Man House. How to fall asleep easily on the beach, to dig clams, to dream a net made of nettles, a medicine of marsh tea boiled out to the open air, a memory of cedar bark coiled, resting for months in cold water to be fashioned into our so-called lifestyle. Clothes for ceremony as well as daily life, canoe bailers, diapers. We used the wood for our half mile longhouse and totems, dried fish, a hard smoke, wooden oval plates that hooked together filled with clear oil of salmon, to wet our palates and smooth our bodies, a shawl of woolly dog now extinct. They were bred on tiny islands we can still identify. Tatouche Island off of Cape Flattery where there were whaling tribes too, the Macaw, one of whose villages collapsed, preserved in silt, later unearthed. And how else? 
which other ceremonies or necessary edges of objects. Our ivory needles, otter pelts, mat creasers, our dances. What else do you remember dreaming of? A kind of rake to skim the waves, to catch tiny fish on rows of twisted nails. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you to Jay for asking me to do this, and uh, thank you all so much. Thank you to Cedar for that. And join us tomorrow for a longer reading from Cedar Saigo. Welcome to the Halley Ford School of Graduate Studies Annual Graduate Symposium. I am Shauna Lipton, Chair of the MA in Critical Studies Program at PNCA. I wanna start off by thanking Megan Gilligan Kane, the Assistant Administrative Director of Graduate Studies for co-organizing this event and Madison Hames, our symposium fellow who worked with us throughout the summer and fall. And to all of our graduate student curators, artists and facilitators involved with this event, whose contributions have been so thoughtful, generous and generative. And I would also like to thank Summer and Sarika for providing ASL interpretation for our keynote talks, both tonight and tomorrow. This symposium was inspired by individuals providing material support for art activism and survival in Portland and beyond, and was organized during the ongoing uprisings against anti-Blackness, police violence and systemic racism, the coronavirus pandemic, and the wildfires that have ravaged the West Coast. We are thinking about mutual aid and community care in light of the calls for defunding and abolishing the police as well as the pushback against ableism, eugenicist rhetoric, medical violence and neglect, and the interlocking crises of white supremacy, settler colonialism, ableism, classism, environmental destruction, capitalist individualism, and neoliberal austerity. Our speakers and guests offer alternative models of safety, care, interdependence, abundance, and collaboratively dreaming new futures and co-creating the world we want to live in. So now I will introduce Izzy Campos Bedard, an MFA in print media candidate, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna jump right into the introduction. On the morning of September 26, 2010, Teresa Rayford's nephew, Andre Dupree Payton, was shot and killed in downtown Portland. Demanding accountability for his senseless death and the lack of investigation services related to other gun violence, Teresa became politically involved and still remains to this day. A frontline advocate for public safety and community empowerment, Teresa has spent the past decade plus meeting with policymakers and state leaders for resolution towards gun violence, systematic discriminatory laws. This includes an invitation to meet Michelle Obama at the White House. In the wake of her nephew's death, Teresa Rayford founded Don't Shoot Portland, a black led human rights nonprofit that advocates for accountability and is known for their intersectional community advocacy. Since 2014, Don't Shoot PDX has implemented art, education, and civil participation initiatives to create social change. To name just a few of Don't Shoot PDX's organizing and activism projects, founding the Children's Art and Social Justice Council, which a focus on utilizing art and history as a vehicle to promote social change and teach children about the mechanisms of community organization. Organizing the annual hashtag reclaim MLK day. Children's March to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the long live long line of civil rights activists who have come before and after Dr. King and demand an end to systematic racism. 
hosting educational workshops to help community members contribute through direct engagement and building legislative power, working towards a shift in cultural and systematic discrimination. Leading a series of workshops in partnership with Multoa County Libraries, Liberated Archives, Archives for Black Lives, where Teresa shared her own family story and outlined tools to help others preserve the stories of their ancestors. Promoting a Know Your Rights campaign and facilitating free legal aid through community legal referral services. Ongoing support for George Floyd Black Lives Matter protests, including disseminating mutual aid BLM, a spreadsheet created to created in the days following George Floyd's murder in order to keep people informed on how to support the movement. By incorporating social media communications, Don't Shoot was able to harness a massive response through mutual aid. And finally, Don't Shoot PDX's a newest initiative, Safer Space for BLM, born out of a need for mental health support for those who identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color as well as those engaged in the BLM movement. Safer Space for BLM speaks to response to persistent symptoms of emotional distress experienced by the Black community. Safer Space for BLM is offering a physical meeting space to receive peer-to-peer -peer support by licensed professionals as well as tele telehealth options. And here at PNCA, we have been honored to partner with Teresa Rayford and Don't Shoot PDX over the past five years to co-create programming around art in social justice, including Juneteenth, Juneteenth Freedom Summer Camp, Reclaim MLK community printmaking events, and Spring Breakout Zine Workshops. In a 2016 interview, Teresa spoke about how she finds the strength to continue to engage in the intense work she does including so much personal content with the families of victims of police violence and system, systemic racism. She said, and I quote, being with students, helping them find out what they want to do with their life. That makes it better. I tell them that when their friends die, it's like, how do you seed back into where we need it? I feel like I'm seeding. Like, okay, let me go ahead and give some things because I know a lot of dead people won't and didn't get an opportunity. I love them a whole lot. When you have that capacity, you give more. So you try. Thank you all for joining us here today. And I am honored to welcome Teresa Rayford. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and just, I just wanted to thank everybody that's tuning in right now and thank you PNCA for having me as a keynote tonight. Um, I just wanted to start off and just talk about a little bit about growing up in Portland, how it was for me. I'm a, a, actually my great grandparents were born here and my mom is one of 10 kids and my dad was one of nine and they both grew up on Northeast 11th and not. Um, so for me, mutual aid isn't anything new and neither is protesting because living in Portland, which a lot of people are proud of, um, the fact that it's America's most uh, uh, whitest city in America, but um, I'm not proud of that. I've, I've dealt with the pain of that. And I just wanted to make sure that we educate the next generation on how to deal with that. Um, I'm hoping that I'm online right now because it seems like my video is stuck. So if someone can let me know that I'm online, I can stop being confused and sorry about that. You look great. Okay, it's on because <laughs> it's stuck on my side. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and talk about, um, so I grew up in Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm the oldest out of 11 kids. Um, my nephew was killed on September 26th of 2010, and that kind of made me reflect on my childhood here. And it wasn't easy. I grew up in foster care, if a lot of people know that, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted accountability uh, from the state of Oregon and from our systems of oppression, because I felt that the fact that I was in childcare was a part of what we're talking about now when we say that people are being displaced from their families. And people didn't understand that in regards to black people because in this state, we were uh, listed as a problem. We weren't considered equal um, partners in society or equal uh, participants in society. And that was very um, 
clear when I started asking for audits after my nephew's death. So we'll go back there. Um, Andre was 19 years old when he was killed on September 26th of 2010. He grew up in Portland. Both of his parents grew up in Portland. He had every opportunity of having access to education, um, a fun childhood, housing and everything else. But the fact of the matter is, is that he was profiled early on, just like a lot of other Black Americans. Um, he was considered at risk, disadvantaged, and marginalized because in our system of, of access, um, when you have those taglines on you and you're a Black person in Portland, that's how funding happens to make referrals available for you. And so my nephew was caught up in this system. And at 19, it wasn't unusual for kids in our community to either die, commit suicide, be unhoused, be pregnant, or have issues in our justice, our criminal justice system. You just had to pick a, a reference for them. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted after his death to stop that from happening. Um, it seemed that a lot of people realized that it was happening, but a lot of people weren't doing anything about it. And so I wanted answers. I wanted to understand how our education system worked because I heard people talking about the education system, the prison, the school to prison pipeline. Um, I wanted to dismantle that. I wanted to make sure that we had adequate access to housing because one of the things that I knew for a fact was that my nephew was unhoused at the time of his death. And I didn't understand how he could have access to so many wraparound services and still find himself not only unhoused, but also murdered in Old Town. Um, you know, there was no response for medical care when he was murdered. Uh, they said that because he was in gang violence or gun violence, that the initiative and the directives at that time were not to render support to him. And so the fact that he was dehumanized in his death and the facts around his death meant that his life could have been saved, but it wasn't valuable, that led me to wanting accountability. So I didn't know it at the time. But wanting answers to all these issues, I became a protester or an activist. Um, I call it an advocate. I call it getting audits, getting information. But the demand for information on evidence that related our humanity to the access to uh, resources was necessary. So I started protesting. I started activating. One of the first things I did was uh, connect with our grandmothers raising grandchildren, which were grandparents that had assumed responsibility for their grandchildren who were in foster care. Um, the stories that they told me so much about why their children were in their custody, things like the children didn't have adequate shoes or that there was a referral um, of services needed against the parent. Um, it, it kind of proved out some of the audits that we had done around overrepresentation in DHS around our foster care system, just initially on black children. Like you could lose your child for demanding access to their education resources. Um, you could lose your child because someone would say that you did something wrong at work. There were all these unnecessary reasons for families being taken apart, but there was no solution, only awareness and proximity to referrals, um, but no investment in keeping families together. So that was necessary. Um, you know, because now in 2020, we're talking about the displacement of families, but in America, and if we talk about our history in America, Black people have always been displaced from their families as a retaliatory act. Um, I never assumed understanding that until my nephew was murdered, because for the fact of the matter is that my brother said to me that he felt that it had something to do with him. So that moved me to do the audits and we saw the overrepresentation. We saw the overrepresentation of black parents in our criminal justice system. We saw the overrepresentation of the numbers of BIPOC people that were unhoused in our community, of BIPOC people that were committing suicide in our community, hungry in our community, not graduating from high school in our community. All of those inequities, once I started building the scope for these audits, um, connected to resources in our community. It connected them to different uh, contractors and opportunities through our state legislator. And I might sound like a protester now putting this communication on the record, but it's necessary for people to be aware of this because we don't know how much power we have to dismantle these processes that literally assume that our bodies are for sale. Um, people in 2014 asked us why we said Black Lives Matter and they asked us why don't you Portland need it to exist? 
it was necessary because in our system of life here in the city of Portland, Black lives only existed for the referral and the maintenance of legislative funding. We have to stop that. We need to dismantle it. It can't be reformed. Um, so <laughs> let's get into that. Um, and it's hard for me to do this because I'm like, we're on Zoom. I'm looking at myself talk. It's kind of weird, but I'm thankful to have an audience that can understand that most of the things that I'm saying to you right now really do depend on you doing your research. Like you can hear what I'm saying, but I'm hoping that you'll take action and find out how this is undermining your own access and your own humanity and society, because these are systems that should not exist going forward. Um, so yeah, I found out all these different elements of oppression. I started you know, demanding advocacy from the same agencies that were oppressing people in my community. I realized that those advocacy uh, requests that I was demanding um, could not render any kind of support for my community because they only existed to quantify the problems. They did not exist to create investments. They did not exist to create resolutions. They did not exist to create engagement that would lead to education for the dismantling of those systems. Again, we were being exploited and we're still being exploited. Um, a lot of people probably don't know that because we got rid of Donald Trump, but we got rid of Donald Trump. We did not really want a system at all. We realized how flawed the system has been since Donald Trump. And so I think that we'll be moving forward as a society, I hope we do, because we have to stop surrendering ourselves to the systems that we're using right now to oppress other people. And we hate being othered, right? <laughs> but so then I'll just continue. But so yeah, I started asking for all these audits in regards to the systems and everything else that was creating an element of oppression that in my opinion, led to the death of my nephew. And once I started doing that, what I realized were that people in my community that respected me, even family members uh, were taken like aback. They were, they couldn't believe that we were demanding accountability from the same system that we depend on, the same system that provides jobs and education and parks and all these beautiful things that people benefit from. Um, they couldn't believe that I was demanding accountability from those systems. But one of the reasons that I had to was because those systems were entangled in the oppression of our community. I mean, when you find police at parks because there are children in parks that have already been systemically marginalized. Um, when you find police in schools with children only focusing on children that have been systemically put at risk. Um, you have to understand that that marginalization is systemic and it's intentional and it does undermine the value of our humanity. So it was important for me to ask for those systems to be held accountable. But again, in society, we have put those systems on such a pedestal to where we feel like uh, demanding accountability is undermining their access or their authority. But we have to undermine their authority, right? We have to do that when we talk about resisting systems or um, electing systems to, to support us. Uh, we have to have a buy-in on that. We have to have a voice in that. We have to have a rendering of our opinions of what we see is necessary, be a part of that. But in society, and especially here in Portland, uh, we don't have access. Even now, there is still a barrier around the access uh, to legitimate concern from our elected leaders or anyone else. So that was no different then, but getting the audits and information on the record, uh, organizing community to advocate for themselves and to provide testimony, that could only lead to the next level of opportunity for us to dismantle these systems, which is the audits that would give us information that we could eventually use to kind of create an opportunity to educate people. And one of the firmest ways I could find to educate once I was kind of rejected by community or discredited by people that benefited from the systems of, of oppression uh, was art. <laughs> you could literally have a whole campaign of information for somebody using art as that instrument to communicate this oppressive uh, system. And one of the reasons that I chose art at the time was because I was receiving so much information from our community around things that were harming them. And I had so much life experience around these things um, that when we started seeking to demand accountability, it became violent for us. People started resisting us in ways um, where not even protesting 
Um, you're, you're just literally making a statement at City Hall or at the State Capitol or Multnomah County Health Department and people in your own community would resist or discredit or reject you um, from social access. And so once that started happening, I felt that it was important for us not only to demand these audits so that we had information on the record that could kind of show our concern was valid, but so that we could also use that information and the responses and more information to kind of hold these systems accountable. But being a black woman in Portland, that's kind of hard because people still see you as a problem. So again, like using the art kind of helped make that a stable um, opportunity because you can't reject um, something that you buy into. And one, one of the things I realized as a protester was that when we would go out on the streets and protest and we would say Black Lives Matter or hands up, don't shoot, or we would say and carry the name of someone that was important to us. Um, people didn't see any value in who we were as individuals or even as a group participating in human rights work. But once we started using the vehicle of art to communicate what those messages meant to us and even the art community uh, speaking to the value of the relationship um, it became safer for us. We saw more alliances building, we saw more allegiance. And that kind of, again, as someone who is a black person that has experienced these atrocities, um, it, it hurt because it was like, wow, I'm not as safe as a piece of art. Like my life is not as valuable as a piece of art, but if you can't control art, it might be able to be utilized to save someone's life. And in the process of trying to save someone's life, sharing and communicating the dialogue or the trainings or the workshops that we do, maybe that can make impact that's necessary. And maybe people will join us, you know, because it's art, right? You might not like black people, but you love art. Everybody loves art, you know? Um, so yeah, we started using art because obviously you can't control art. You can't discredit art. You can't reject art. Um, you can't humiliate art. You can talk about it. You can have your opinion. You can have your feeling. But the expression that someone puts forth um, to kind of render a feeling to you, it's necessary. And that's what we do. Um, that's what has been necessary. That's what created an opportunity for us to use our art to educate people. And one of the things I learned early, and Megan probably has heard me say this, is that um, in the arts community, it, it seemed as if the, at the beginning there was a competition as if artists felt that maybe activists weren't really artists. You know, we're making banners and signs and maybe you might not see that as art, but it's very intentional when we do um, protests. It's very intentional when we activate and when we resist, when we organize, we are using an artistic choreography to kind of create an element of space that will kind of speak to people that are paying attention. And we're hoping in that space that the people paying attention will actually move to action. And I think that when we share art, it's kind of the same thing. You know, the artist doesn't tell you what to feel, but they hope that you feel something. And so when we started using art as a bridge to communicating um, what we do with Don't Shoot Portland, people started seeing us as people. Um, people started being curious about the families that we show up for. People started showing up for us and our community. And so we were able to build a Sedgeway, not only um, through the issues and the resistance necessary to build social change um, through social justice allocation, um, but we were also able to kind of create a, 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 an obstacle to that surrendering to the system. Um, building community through art and education gave us an opportunity to build and manage um, mutual aid, you know, and mutual aid BLM, it may have become a, a thing that we, we referred to during the George Floyd protest, but it was our community action plan before George Floyd died. It's been our community action plan for the last 10 years because we felt that if community could show up for community, then we wouldn't have to rely on all these systems that oppress us, right? We wouldn't have to rely on the SROs or the neighborhood policing agency or the um, agency that needs to us to re, you know, waive our FERPA rights so that they can have access to our family. 
um, rights, you know, waiving a purpose, your, your federal education rights to privacy, but a lot of programs where you would just want to get, you know, reduced lunch or, you know, uh, you know, sun school programming or something, you might be asked to waive those rights. And that led to overrepresentation. But once we started building mutual aid, we were able to do magnificent things in our community that were community led, that are community grassroots. And a lot of those things are coming to fruition now, like we just saw in the latest election, how now we have access to preschool for all of our kids. We don't have to send them just to early childhood education programs like Albina Head Start, where you know they might have a relationship with the Portland police or Sun School, where they might have a relationship with the police. And I'll say these agencies, but it's because I advocate for families who have lost their children um, through those programs. And so I have to say those agencies because in my opinion, they're complicit um, with the systems of oppression in our community that lead to the oppression and the overrepresentation in our community. So, you know, assume me, I don't care. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so yeah, we started using the audits. We had the art, we, you know, social justice, um, started educating community, building more networks in community. Our action plan started developing into all these different um, grassroots movements, which we support fully. Anybody that knows um, Don't Shoot Portland knows that we don't want to be the only organization fighting to dismantle the systems of oppression. We like for everyone to get into that industry so that we don't have to rely on the status quo for the things that we need as community members. I hope if no one takes anything else away from anything that we do, that they realize that we believe in community engagement and that community matters. Um, so yeah, um, <laughs> um, I'll give people time to ask questions. I'll talk a lot. Um, I wanna hear from people. I wanna know what people feel about you know the things that we do. Um, in the intro, a lot of the things that we do as far as our programming was mentioned, the Children's Art and Social Justice Council, um, I began doing that programming intentionally because I would see the children protesting with us all year round and I would see them with their families and I would see the trauma that they were enduring constantly. And the curiosity that I had was how were they managing to help the families process that after our protest, what were we managing to share with our children about why we were protesting. And so I built the Children's Art and Social Justice Council as a way to put the children first so that we could put their needs first um, in the family and in community. Um, and, you know, putting them first meant like educating them on the reasons that we protest on the history of our country and on the ways to use art as a measure of opportunity to dismantle the things that they don't want to carry into their generation. And this past year, I, uh, there was a writing campaign, but <laughs> it's funny because um, a lot of the children that put that together are children that have been protesting with me since they were probably six years old. Um, but they know it, they get it, they got it. Um, and they didn't have to get it just that protest or through Don't Shoot Portland. We worked so hard over the last 10 years to make Black Lives Matter a community component that they get that kind of value in their school from their teachers, from educators. Um, and in most cases, um, people that probably denied us the value of our protest um, because they didn't understand it at one point, but realized that it was something that was necessary for all of us because until Black Lives Matter, no lives matter. Um, I see there's like a question and thing, current leaders, future ancestors, that part, you know? Um, right now, even in my life, I've known, I'm, I'm 50 years old now, so you can see my gray hair, but I've just realized that a lot of the things that I do forward movement um, are based on the things that I was told when I was a child. I grew up in foster care, but in between living in those group homes and staying on the street with friends, I had great grandparents that I would go to for like respite or sanctuary. And be, even before foster care, you know, before I was eight years old and had to go into the system, um, I remember every single thing that they used to tell me about how they grew up in America. And as I and my brothers and sisters, and even now our bigger community of organizers and activists and families, um, if we lean on the values that people in the past that had to surrender their humanity to push forward, like you, you can't be tired when you black in America. You can't be weak when you black in America. You know, you could be hungry, you could be poor, you could be unhoused. 
but you can't be tired and weak. And that's, that's like, it, it takes away your humanity. But learning from the people who were subjected to that as a child, it helps you endure. It helps you see through that. It helps you realize who you are. It helps you have a prospect of value for your own life. And so that's why it's important when we talk about intergenerational organizing. A lot of people are like, what does that mean? You're organizing with different age groups. Yeah, and it's sometimes it's intentionally. And we're doing it with indigenous communities. And we're doing it with black communities within our communities because what I've learned as an organizer is sometimes we don't see the value in their voices. We'll come into a space where again, as people that have been legitimately left behind by this country, because it's legitimate to leave us behind in this country, but have been left behind in this country, the organizing asset that a lot of people have, we don't have in our communities. Um, black people were meant and treated as second-class citizens in this country. And so when you talk about your rights, your civil liberties, your right to protest, um, your right to demand accountability for all of society, it looks like it's undermining the values of authority. Um, not just for the people that are upholding the status quo, people are not used to seeing black people fight for liberation and to stand up, even though we've done it forever since 1619, you know, even before we were, you know, when we were brought here before it was legal. Um, we fought for the liberation and for our humanity, um, but we don't tell those stories right now in 2020 and the whole 10 years that I've been protesting and that a lot of people around this country have been protesting, we have intentionally, because of our ancestors, documented our stories. We've shared our stories. We're amplifying our stories because we don't want this generation to miss that opportunity to use what we're doing right now to move us forward in the future. Right now we're making the change and we're making the space for change so that they can grab hold of it and have that guidance and that strength to move forward because they can't start from scratch and they don't need to reinvent the wheel. And we won't let them. We're not gonna let them. We have too much technology right now. Uh, one of the things I used to tell people when I was doing bystander intervention trainings after the max stabbings when Jeremy Joseph Christian killed two people in our community and white people came to me and asked me like what can I do to help black people you know people had ideas about singing and you know using bear mace on white supremacists and I said be a better neighbor you know do something different in your own social space that connects and engages with people that you have other and don't say you have black friends and you have these relationships, find out who your direct neighbors are because there's probably people in your own neighborhood that you won't ever associate with. You'll go to a protest for black lives and live next door to black people and won't knock on their door because you feel uncomfortable. Um, we have to break those, those systems of oppression because when it's at home, it matters. Um, it hurts, it's relative. It empowers people that would harm all of us and we have to stop it. Um, silence is complicity. It's not just a statement on a sign. It actually exists and it actually hurts us. People actually have to break that shit down and stop it. Um, somebody's asking me what you said about our art being more visible and considered than we really hit home for me as a black woman in Portland myself, I feel the weight of being seen as a problem every day in so many years. I don't know if you want me to read this, so I'm just like, oh, should I be reading this? But no, I think art, because of how we are treated in society, if you don't use art, you'll never get rid of that trauma. Um, you have to work through it. We use it, We and I don't have a PhD in trauma therapy. You know, we tried it even with yoga and the, and the yoga instructors started fighting because they were two white people that had enough privilege to support us, but it was incredible. But no, you have to, you have to use your art because it helps you. It helps you. And what, what I've learned is that you got to put the mask on. You have to put your mask on so that you can be healthy enough and informed and supported enough in order to support other people. And so that if you can use art to communicate how you're feeling, even if you never show it to anyone else, it makes you stronger. You have somewhere to put um, all of this, this trauma and all this vicious violence um, so that it doesn't become a part of who you are. Um, people, even when I was a kid going through foster care and stuff, people would ask me like, how did you avoid being this person or that person? And I'm not gonna say I never did what people consider bad stuff. I, I survived in life. 
Um, but I never let what I had to do to survive or the elements around me consume who I was as a person. Um, and that was because I saw the value in myself. That's because I had those grandparents telling me that I could do anything and that we were important. And when they shared their stories of oppression with me, that mattered, that, that gave me power because I knew I didn't have to overcome those obstacles to get where I needed to go. And so that's again, why we use art and education and our culture and our history to kind of create the paradigm of communication so that people will know that, hey, we're not moving backwards to help get us all forward, but you might need to go backwards to see where we're at right now. Because some people think that we're just now getting to racism. Um, people like myself know that we've always been in racism. We're on stolen land. My family was stolen and brought here in the most violent way. And we're still here and we're not gonna leave it this way. So yeah, ask me some questions. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, we have a question in the Q&A and we welcome um, anybody who wants to put a question in the Q&A, we'll go through those. Um, Mark says, Teresa, I have always known you to value and uplift accessibility in your outreach. How or what forged that commitment for you? Oh my goodness. When, when I first came home um, and I asked about all my friends, so many people had lost their lives. So many people were sick. Um, so many of my friends' children had been involved in violence and they were not accessible to everybody. They had been put up, you know, and I hate that word, put up. And so I was going and visiting all these put up kids. And that's kind of why, you know, when I started Don't Shoot Portland, I was like, how do you have all these babies that have been affected by violence, all these people in our community that have been affected by violence to the point of a disability, to the point where, you know, maybe, you know, they got shot and they didn't die and they no longer can move around or, you know, their parents are the only ones taking care of them. There's no services that are being, you know, rendered or no education or no engagement with that family to help make their life better or to help um, see concern to their daily issues and when I wanted to fight for everybody <laughs> I didn't want to not include them they're the people I was fighting for because they were the ones that weren't going to show up to city hall or you know the state capitol or Multnomah county because first of all they didn't know how that was going to help them and second of all there was a big issue with getting there there was a big issue with getting a lift on TriMed or even, you know, having somebody at the house that could help them, you know, get ready for a meeting. And so um, that being a concern and that's something that I address right now, I wanted to make sure that when they did show up that we were ready for that, you know, in our community. And I'm still trying to find ways to be better at it because um, to me, when we talk about changing and reconstructing and dismantling systems of oppression, we have to look at the most vulnerable community and make it right for that community so that we can all fit in because we don't fit in without our entire community. You know what I'm saying? There's not an event that matters if everybody's not invited, even mine. Absolutely. Um, we have another question. How do you envision early childhood educators better involving their students in social issues and activism? I think it's necessary. I think it's very necessary. And I think that because of the state and how we have this mandate on, um, you know, mandatory reporting, um, that child, early childhood education also should be a, a system that supports, not confronts the family's need for investment and support. You know, um, that's where a lot of like a lot of the people I advocate for, a lot of the grandmothers raising grandchildren, their children were identified as unsafe in their parents' custody in early childhood education because of our community policing component. And so I think that if those education systems had more of an awareness of social issues, that mandatory reporting wouldn't lead to overrepresentation. It would lead to services being rendered and investment opportunities for agencies that want to help families. I hope I answered your question. And then what about um, the children themselves, do you think? Um, learning about social justice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's important. I mean, the children, once they, they learn, the babies are sponges. 
um, they're learning, they want to know who they are in the world and they don't wanna be second class citizens. Um, and children know, when I started advocating for children early on, it was mostly kids in early childhood education because they had these, um, these kind of CUBs or something. They had, um, like a lot of the black kids had already had um, IEPs. Um, and it was a trip because they literally, when I looked at the reasoning, it had to do with like, I don't know how to control this kid and you're not supposed to want to control kids, but the system did not allow for a lot of resources that the teachers needed in their classrooms. And they didn't have a lot of cultural diversity in their education pool of educators. And so there's this big disconnect because of cultural differences that was happening in the schools. And rather than connecting the children with those needs, whether it was social justice awareness or educators of color, um, we found policing as a valuable asset to dealing with that issue or um, our health agencies that could help police families um, to provide safety for the kids because obviously being black and living in a black household might be unsafe for you if you feel like black people are scary people. So, you know, it's very important. Thank you so much. Um, so Vo has a comment and a question. Hey Vo. <laughs> so Vo says, uh, so glad you're in the world, Teresa. What's next for you? Oh my goodness. Um, you know, I'm like suing everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, suing everybody, um, including President Trump and the city of Portland for abuse that they have perpetrated on people here in Portland over the summer, um, creating this PDX safer space so that we can deal with the trauma that we're all enduring because we are courageous enough to dismantle this system of oppression and we need support. Um, I think that right now for me is our most essential project going forward. I'm working with Dr. Anita Randolph, who's also the scientist that published the science and research that we used for our lawsuits um, against the city of Portland and Chadwa um, because of the use of tear gas against people. We cited in the research that not only the use of force, but also the trauma that is being inflicted on the general public because of the violence and because we were quarantined before the violence, um, that that would create um, emotional and mental and physical irreparable harm. And since that is cited in our science and because we love our community and we're advocates, we can't stop at a lawsuit. We have to render aid. And so that's what we're gonna be doing. And I don't know how long COVID is gonna last. So rendering mutual aid and those services for our health so that we can continue resisting. That's the most important thing that I can provide. And because I'm 50 years old, I'm gonna use that as an excuse and say, y'all do more, let me do less, please. And my face is all sore. <laughs> um, so Quinn asks, what advice do you have for youth trying to navigate understanding these systems of oppression and how can they get involved in constructive ways? Yay, don't try, do it. <laughs> That's the first thing, don't try. Like, um, just do it, do it from where you are. I tell adults all the time and I can tell you cause y'all know everything, don't listen to us. Um, but start honing in on the things that are important to you and make that a thing because society needs new values. And obviously those values don't exist. And I think that those values exist in your hearts, in your minds. And I think the innovation and the inspiration for building them are happening right now. So don't second guess anything that you wanna do in the world to make change, just do it, you know? Um, it's important, like you might wanna write a book, you might wanna do some video, you might wanna go out and take pictures and create artist descriptions and narratives around them. We need to be informed. Um, we need to start sharing and communicating as a society so that we can level out our trauma um, and support each other, you know? One of the reasons that we're in the issues that we're in right now are because we never connected as society. When Dr. King got murdered and then other civil rights leaders got murdered, we were like, oh, racism is over. And that's odd, right? You kill the civil rights leader and then all of a sudden racism is over. But it's not, and your generation knows that. So like, don't let us keep walking backwards. 
just do whatever is in your power to do. Whatever feels good to you, that's what's necessary. That's your message. Um, Araceli asks, any tips on conversations about accountability with our professors, educators, and or institutions when their efforts are or seem to be performative? Yeah, ask them to resign and write books um, because we don't need them educating another generation. The miseducation is horrible. It hurts all of us. It's to the detriment of us moving forward. Um, I was talking to someone earlier that was interviewing me and I told them that in 2014, when we were kettled by the police in a very violent um, engagement where they attacked us and assaulted us and then kettled us for several, maybe 40 minutes, um, that educators, that um, it was the literal um, academia world that spoke to lawyers that said, hey, we don't believe that there is any justice that could be sought by these groups or these people because of these actions, right? And I guess the actions were like, and at the time these people were literally, and I'm saying my people were protesting on the sidewalk and then like literally probably went in the street for a minute, but that was for Diane. But their actions called for the detainment and the illegal, um, you know, the illegal reference of, of ending their, their protests. Like they literally were disqualified from their freedom of speech because the police felt that it was time for them to go home. It was like a shift ending. And academia was like, yeah, those are black people in the street, don't do that. And they were out there being wild and walking in the streets, they should have had a permit. Academia has been wrong about so many things. <laughs> um, so I, I, I choose not to listen to them. And if you know there's someone harmful, I don't think they can be reformed. I think we need to dismantle them. So yeah, get, dismantle them please, if you can, tell them to go on their own way. Maybe they need something else, but they should not be educating people if they're backwards, I'm not going back. So, so this feels like a good follow-up question from Chris. It feels impossible to take on this fight without encountering and navigating within the same systemically oppressive systems that we want to dismantle. How do you balance and reconcile this reality? But that's why we have to dismantle our relationships with the system. That's where mutual aid exists so that it takes place. What I, what I was telling someone earlier is that mutual aid for me started in 2010 when I realized that as a person that grew up in foster care, that also dealt with domestic violence, that went through our education system, that had witnessed and advocated for so many people, that the system inherently was the problem. Um, my thought was to dismantle that access. I started building opportunities to kind of create agency, let's say, um, events maybe, um, to build, you know, resources for our community, whether it was food or health resources or educational resources. We started committing to building and distributing our own access so that we didn't have to depend as much on, on the system. Um, and it was because of necessity and Black America, Black people in America that have been a part of the, the diaspora of, of trauma and violence, we've always had to rely on mutual aid and building our own community. And some communities, people are not dependent on the system, you know, for housing and, and education and stuff, because they know that that system is investigating and interrogating their families. They know that it leads to displacement and overrepresentation in different systems of oppression. Um, but we have to model what we know and we have to start doing better by creating more opportunities. As somebody that worked for an accountant for 15 years and witnessed several audits, if something doesn't work, you usually lose your opportunity to funding, right? Um, in the systems of oppression, those same people continuously get funded. But one thing that would stop the funding is when we start not participating, if we decided to like not participate. Um, with COVID, we're seeing that that's reasonable because we all have to start building society within our own little bubbles, right? Um, the school system's not working online, jobs are hard to come by, but we're finding out that we're essential because we're human beings and we can provide resources within our own communities to each other. We can barter, we can buy from each other. And I think we need more of that. I think that, um, I don't want to say COVID is a blessing, it's not. 
is devastating. And even the response of our elected leaders is devastating, but it's provided us evidence of their uh, inability to connect and to engage with us on a way that would actually provide a safety net for any of us or concern for that matter. So shifting to a pretty different context than Portland, Oregon, um, Timothy Ramos has a question. Um, moving to rural Texas to run for mayor of a city of, that's right, you know Texas too, right? Um, 20, a city of 20,000 that has a 20% poverty rate, average age of 33, and is 30 is 53% brown folks. What are some suggestions um, that you have for engaging <laughs> a community like that? Oh my God, do it. I mean, you know the community. San Antonio is dope. You know I know you who is what. Um, I mean, just do it. I mean, the thing is, is to connect with the community and the youth in that community and to start doing your own internal audit in the city's bureau of how they distribute resources, where they are lacking, uh, the pros and cons. Uh, start thinking for yourself about things that you feel you could do better. Um, become connected with the city as a resource and think of yourself as that resource and how you would distribute the, the resources that are necessary for the, the city to work. Um, that's literally how you have to think because when you're the manager, the city manager, the mayor, um, the you know executive director of the council or whatever they, they use as that term or whatever those directives fall under, um, you just literally need to have an inherent understanding of how that system works and why it's necessary for you to work from a position of courage and will um, to build something different because a lot of people will go in there and they will maintain the system in the way that it is and uphold the system in the way that it is and they'll be excited about all these new um, relationships they have because now they are part of the patriarchy and they will allow the system to move forward as it exists. Um, people like us that want to dismantle it and resist it, we understand it inherently as flawed and we seek to dismantle the flaws within it. And that's where you have to go in, be motivated to pull things apart and let people that are working in that direction know that you're an ally and that you need to understand what they understand so that you can help them. Because people do look for leadership. And a lot of times uh, the leaders don't go to speak to those people. And we learn that here in Portland, we won't engage with people that have committed to serve our community. And that's why our communities feel like there's chaos happening. We have another question from MP. Um, MP says, I agree that we must dismantle the system in order for folks of color to be liberated. However, some folks, even in my community believe that the ideology is considered too radical. Any advice on how to approach that struggle? And I think from someone who identifies as a person of color. Yeah, I would say that that idea would be radical in a place where the people stole the land and then stole some people and brought them over here. Of course, it's gonna be radical that you have to give that land back to the people and that you have to liberate the people that you stole. Um, we have to think from the position of those stolen people, and we have to say that if I want to be liberated, I don't want to participate in this system. That's how I feel. I don't want to participate in it. Even when they were doing the write-in campaign, all I thought about was if it worked, how we were going to dismantle the system from the inside. So I hope that answers your question. I hope. Um, we have another question that is about the future. Um, is there a plan for the future that you can envision past five or 10 years, or are you more looking at a step-by-step, day-by-day process? Well, people that know me know that I plan 30 years in advance because <laughs> I'm trying to build plans that community members will attach themselves to, and whether I exist or not, they are a part of our community infrastructure plan uh, for the community action plan. Yeah, I go 10, 20, 30 years ahead um, to build plans. And so, yeah, <laughs> I got a little to see it. But a lot of times if I don't, it's still going to happen. Um, in 30 years, um, I see this community looking so much different. I see generations of children saying, what's a mayor? 
Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that um, housing is going to be an issue. I think, you know, basically what some people call universal income will be the thing because we'll realize that it takes less effort to share resources than it does to, you know, accommodate violence to protect them. Um, yeah, stuff like that. Like, I hope we're still able to breathe because right now it seems like we're on the fast track um, to killing the earth that provides resources for all of us. But I'm hoping that this generation right now um, can stop that in the next 10 years so we can be here in 30 years. But yeah, I, I want to live long enough to see kids say, what's a mayor? And really because we get the land back. And I really think that everybody should fight for that. Because once there's sovereignty um, for the people whose land that we're on, who, who are the original occupants, um, then we can all be allowed to stay or to go. But I don't think that if we don't make that commitment, I feel like if we don't make that commitment that we're all doomed for, you know, all the things that we deserve. I'd love to hear you speak a little bit more on that, Teresa. It seems like the especially with Don't Shoot, the indigenous communities and Black Lives Matter have really found a lot of solidarity and connection and shared struggle. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, about that, that partnership and, and how you envision um, like this? Aid with, yeah, how, how you envision um, connecting your shared struggles. Um, yeah. and, and Well, my, and my family, like my grandmother was born and raised in Mississippi. And so we have indigenous blood, but the fact of the matter is that in America, they had these systems of oppression that actually accommodated who you are in America as well. Like you couldn't be indigenous if you had this much black blood, and but you could be indigenous if you had this much white blood or you could pay to be indigenous if you were a white person. And so there's this land grab that happened um, because of racism and the proprietary nature of a process. And what I believe is that the people who are the original inhabitants of this land, whose land we are on, um, that I believe that we have to rectify that as a country. Um, I really believe that. And even to the point where, you know, when I am asked or I am, you know, engaged with my community, um, we, we give what we can, we give what we need to. We, there's no no <laughs> in supporting our indigenous communities and especially our unincorporated land communities because um, America has forgotten about entire societies and generations of people that upheld and kept this land valuable for all of us to benefit from it today. Um, all these natural resources, everything was cultivated by people that we've thrown to the side and ignored and harmed so many ways. Um, society as a whole is very, in my opinion, like I couldn't imagine, you know, being in my native land and having all of these people doing all of these things and talking about freedom and liberty and justice. And, you know, like that's, that's horrendous that you would take from people and kill people and hurt people to get there and not think that you have to rectify those wrongs. And so the work that we do right now with Fires Igniting the Spirit and just a lot of different communities of color is to rectify those wrongs within our own community. And we know as people that were stolen and brought to this land that they're not holding that against us, but we also know that anti-Blackness in this country exists. And I found the most support, and also I know there's anti-Blackness in every community, but when it was recognized by our indigenous community that it existed and they said they would resist it and that they would hold everybody accountable to understanding that liberation of black people uh, mattered and that people couldn't use anti-blackness to continue to hold us down because that was another way of holding their communities down um that that felt like family to me you know that meant a lot to me and so i consider our communities of uh, people that have been forgotten about um whose land we're on, you know, the Maloma, the Chinook, like I feel that that we owe, our, our children need to know this. <laughs> they need to know this history. They need to know the history of how we, how we were brought to this land. And they need to understand the history of why we're still here so that in their hearts and in their minds, they can do what's necessary to rectify the wrongs because we can't be celebrating shit like Thanksgiving. You know what I'm saying? And making it seem like that is an appropriate American holiday 
you know, when we know that it is an atrocity that happened and it's vicious, the intent was vicious and the plan worked, the goal actually succeeded and we're in it right now. And I'm not happy about that at all. So I do whatever I can to help my brothers and sisters because we're not going back. Like we're helping through our programming and education and mutual aid to our indigenous communities. We're educating our children so that they'll never see that that is okay to treat people that way. We, they have to see it through social change. We can't just talk about it. We can't just proclaim that the holidays don't exist. We actually have to do the work. So we have um, a comment from Jasmine and I hope I pronounce this correctly. Jasmine Sergia Kahananui. Um, and she says, Mahala Nui, muchas gracias. Um, very great, um, my, let's see. No, she says, may grateful community members provide you baked goods. <laughs> and then, she, and then, then lol, for real though. Um, I'm not speaking about community resources to community organizations. I'm doing that. I'm in that. I'm referring specifically to supporting you and how, um, how you're calling upon folks to do more so you can do less. How may we practice <laughs> and observe reciprocal relationships in the gifts that you've provided and shared with us? Uh, Aloha Nui Loa, XOXO, <laughs> um, from uh, uh, Kanaka Maoli Mahu, a queer native Hawaiian. Yay, be you baby, freely. Like continue to resist, that's, that's all I want. I'm so happy to see like this generation, these new generations, millennials, babies, um, I'm happy to see them regarding life. You know, they're not, they're not intimidated by systems. They're not impressed by patriarchy or capitalism. Um, they actually have the capacity to love even though all of this bullshit that's happened around them has existed. Um, and that's wonderful to me. And I wanna see more of that. I wanna see a generation that benefits from that you know, um, because it becomes our society rule, you know, like we have to be free, but we have to live free and we have to build free and we have to understand what true liberation means. And so it's not about accommodating anything that I need. I think we all need that to happen, but it, it starts with us. So just be who you are and be thankful and free in that so that the rest of the world can benefit from that light because we need it. It affirms us. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, I think we've come to the end of our question so far, but I encourage anyone who has any more to put them in the Q&A. Um, we do have a video and a couple images if you'd like for us to put those up, if you wanna talk yes. about those. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about the video real quick. So the images would go with parts of the conversation that I had, but the video, when we got the land acknowledgement, it talked about having the power um, to move to action after the acknowledgement. Like you hear the acknowledgement, it's like, oh, I feel good. But how do you create an incorporation of the movement to action? And in the video that you're gonna see, um, my friend Sammy um, had been killed in Portland last year in June. And um, in November of that year, I had invited his family and his tribe to come to the Portland Art Museum because we were doing an installation with Hank Willis Thomas. And I created all of these different posters from Martin Luther King's assassination because Sammy, for me, was like one of these kids that want to change the world. And so um, I wanted to have a protest for him, but I knew that his family didn't really want that. And so in my space of being an artist, I was able to create an installation um, about all things being equal. And I invited his tribe to come out and people from the tribal community came out and did a land acknowledgement. And up until that time, they had been seeking questions and answers about his shooting and the murder. And that Monday, we, we did the land acknowledgement and the event for Sammy on that Saturday. And on that Monday, they arrested somebody um, for his murder. 
and I know I'm a police abolitionist, you know, I want to get rid of the police and everything else, but it was important for something to happen in response to his murder because um, that just, you know, like you don't just take somebody's life and then not have to deal with that. Um, and as a society, we need to see that that comes together so that families get closure. But having the land acknowledgement and bringing art and community together and then having someone maybe speak out or an investigator or a detective that actually knew something doing what they need to do to, to harness that, that situation for his family was important and it happened. And so, um, yeah, I just, I wanted to say that about the video because you're gonna see images in there and people probably have questions and we probably won't talk about that anymore. So thank you again for having me. I hope you um, see the images and are inspired to do some work. Um, it, they, the images are about art and activism. And the reason that I use those images is because when we first started doing art to support our activism after my arrest in August of 2015, um, I heard from artists that they didn't feel like activists were artists. And I brought that up, but I made these images available so that you could see our art because it is our heart and you can't control art. So love y'all, Black Power. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, Weston, can we play the video? Please. Y'all should definitely stay for the video. It's amazing. <laughs> There's no sound on the video. Where's the sound at? We're going to get it. Thank you all for your patience. <laughs> that Zoom life. Did you want me to answer those last questions before we get off since the video was only one minute? Yes. Okay. If you read them to me, <laughs> I'm like, I, those words are so small. Let's see. Okay. So we have a question, um, a couple anonymous questions. Not anonymous. Um, what are your thoughts on negotiating or balancing cooperation, collaboration, and coalition with organizations or systems like nonprofits or governments? Um, the nonprofit industrial complex is a hell of a drug. Stay away. Um, <laughs> I've been trying to tell my friends because this past year, a lot of um, our community members started using their cash apps and Venmos and stuff like that. And they're doing the work and people are supporting them. And I think that when people, when like myself, tell the general public to divest from those organizations and nonprofits, even like my own, you know, I don't tell them to divest from don't shoot, but I ask them to rethink how they spend their money. Um, I think that it's important for us to create autonomy and that we not participate in a system if we can help it. If you rose up this summer and people are following you and supporting you, don't institute or create an institution 
for your work, continue doing your work as a person, as a participant in society and don't participate in the system if you can help it. Um, I was being arrogant when I started Don't Shoot Poor when I created the nonprofit so I could fuck the system because they had arrested me and I felt like I was gonna sue them and put the money back into the system to sue people for people that got arrested. Um, and so it was kind of me being vindictive, but I don't, um, I don't, you know, I don't think that people should start nonprofits to, if they want to support their communities. I think that's something that people should just do as community members, because we become part of the problem at some point. Um, we don't want to continue feeding into these systems of oppression just because they exist to make us feel safe. I think we need to invest in building communities so that we can actually be safe and have resources without harming one another. Um, how can we resist holidays like Thanksgiving in a society where our education system and our families make it so that it is, accept it is expected to celebrate that holiday? How can we fight against a society where it is deemed almost rude to avoid this time for family and giving thanks? Well, COVID's helping us out this year. <laughs> Don't go to family gatherings. Don't promote that information. Um, you know, a lot of times I noticed when Mike Brown got murdered, I think that was our, like in my lifetime, the first time that we really challenged racism and oppressive systems and agency of holidays. And I think that what we need to do is we need to use the challenges that people have made, um, the uprisings, the legitimacy of deprogramming Thanksgiving and turning it into Indigenous Day. Um, it's more than a proclamation. It's the way that we carry ourselves in society. And I think we just have to do more of it. The more we resist, the more people realize how vicious it is to celebrate atrocities and violence. Um, and they stop. And I think that if we see it as an atrocity and violent, that we won't worry about, um, you know, making people feel uncomfortable. Um, they should feel uncomfortable for making you feel uncomfortable about celebrating violence. In my opinion, most holidays are connected to violence. Capitalism is extremely connected to violence. And I think the more we educate ourselves on those uh, assurances that America has depended on, that we will resist them and we won't invest in them. You have to do that. <laughs> um, so we have a pretty long question from Drew, um, but I think it's a good point. Um, having had boots on the ground since the summer, it seems like a lot of community members who routinely participated in direct actions have lost the momentum that we were maintaining in the days leading up to the election. Now with the election of tear gas Teddy, um, who was overwhelmingly supported by vi voters, um, we seem to be back where we started. Um, I'm gonna kind of, the cops have never respected um, TROs and now the city council is stacked with members who seem likely to refuse any abolitionist reforms to the system. As a young artist act and activist who's been shot with chemical weapons, and had my face thrown in the concrete and arrested by cops, I only see the same cycle repeating itself, if not getting worse. Mm -hmm. Where do we, what do we do next? Where do we focus? Well, one of the things that Don't Shoot Portland did was we put out that scientific research. And even if you're not a part of our lawsuits, I would lose, use the information in there to file lawsuits against them. My thing is that things cost money. And when you harm people, it costs money. Um, even if you, let's say, you, 10,000 people go to small claims court and file complaints against the city for the trauma that they endured during the tear gassing. Um, you know, take their money, hold them accountable, put it on the record. When I got arrested in, well, before I got arrested, but in 2014, when we had the kettling, um, I knew like after academia literally said, oh, that wasn't a real protest and those aren't real protesters. Those are just black people being upset and they didn't get a permit. So maybe they needed to be stopped. Um, when that happened and nobody would file our lawsuit, nobody would take our lawsuit, you know, like the lawsuits they're taking now that I'm paying for. Um, it was it was a trip to me, but it occurred to me that we had to undermine that system, period. And so, yeah, you, you just have to do that. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard. You just have to sue it. I mean, use the system against itself. 
put it on the record that you've been harmed, elevate it to the point that it shows the harm and make them pay for it. Um, we're not gonna stop. I, I've been protesting for 10 years since my nephew died. I never gave a mayor a break. Charlie Hales didn't get a break. Sam Adams didn't get a break. Ted Wheeler didn't get a break. He's not gonna get a break this time because we got kids on the ground that are formally educated in protest and resistance and they understand the model of social change um, being something that is inherently necessary for our human rights and dignity to exist in this city and this society. So we can't stop that. You know, like it's not gonna be easy, but we've talked about the violence that got us in America and the fact that they would use violence to take land and then use more violence to bring people here um, in a violent way to work the land and to treat all people of color that come to this land as second class citizens just because of the value to uphold white supremacy. Those values exist in Portland. It's nothing new. Um, it's the same day, different, you know, different set of people continue to resist it only thing you can do if you participate in it you're feeding into it um if you're quiet about it it's complicity our our job on earth we're doing planet we're doing time on planet earth pretty much um do your time wisely you know educate people on what they need to do to resist it's sad it's it's very sad where we are um i know a lot of people that have given their lives so that we can move forward as a society and I think that in this past election that just happened, a lot of those efforts were um, unsupported. Um, but even with my own campaign, I knew that Portlanders, Portlanders, not just black Portlanders, not just white Portlanders, not just activist community. I knew that Portlanders would not elect a black woman that is fighting to abolish these systems. Um, but I also knew that the people that we were willing to elect are also part of the problem. Um, either way, if I would have won, I would have been part of the problem. I'm not winning. I'm still part of the problem because I can't resist it fully, but we have to start making that happen intentionally in any way that we're able. Like I didn't build this system. I was just snatched up and brought over here. I'm not happy here. I wish I could do something about it right now before my grandkids grow up. I don't think I can. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, we have word that the video is ready to go. Um, do you have any final thoughts before we move to the video? No, I just one of the things y'all uh, put on a poster a couple of years ago is that resistance is happening now. Even if you protested in the summer and you know never protested before then and you never protest again, resistance is happening now and it won't stop and we're not going back. And just remember that and thank you. Thank you all so much for coming and thanks to Teresa for sharing so much. We appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Peace, everybody. <laughs>